<laughs> Good, here we go. Hi, John, how are you? I am well, Armando, how are you? Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you for this time this afternoon. Uh, John, I, this is John Chancio with WealthPoint, and I'm talking with John this afternoon uh, from the perspective of someone who has a business that's that's been built over years through blood, sweat, and tears. And what I'd like you to do, John, if we can, as we have our conversation, is just talk about really how how a business owner who say is age 40 or 50 or, or older has had this one business for you know 20, 25 years. Now is at the point where he or she realizes that they're gonna have to step out of that business somehow, some way. They've got to sell it maybe to an employee, maybe to a private equity firm. They don't know what they don't know, but they realize they've got a business worth a lot of money. They have one chance to get it right. And if we could just talk about the things that are part of that, uh, which I realize is a lot. <laughs> but... We could talk for a long time about that, Armando. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So we'll talk maybe for the next hour. Maybe we'll have some other conversations like this on more more detailed information, um, but let's just have a general conversation. And I, I will, I'll, let's go ahead and start there. And, and, and my name is Armando uh, Roman. I'm with Axiom here in Scottsdale. Uh, we help founders of businesses preserve their American success story. So John, let me ask you to, again, just introduce yourself quickly. And in, the, in, in a nutshell, why would that business founder want to talk with you? How can you help them? Well, that's a great question. Um, I'm with a firm called WealthPoint, which is a boutique small firm, 35 of us or so. And we really have a laser focus on creating the outcomes that business owners want uh, from that financial asset when it comes time to transition to exit the business or, or pass it on through some sort of a succession event. And that's all we do. We're, we don't manage money or sell products or anything. It's really uh, a fee-based service business to just really help owners achieve the outcomes they want and they need and they deserve from their operating business assets when it's time to go to the next chapter in their lives. Okay. So we've been doing that for about 14 years with 150 plus family groups. And I kind of describe us as the, uh, as the farmer's insurance type guys of succession planning. We, we, we know a thing or two because we've seen a thing or two. I mean, <laughs> this crazy game just takes a lot of reps and it's all experiential learning. And um, all of us partners in the firm, we are all our own clients more or less because we've all been serial entrepreneurs in the past, having started businesses, built them, monetized them, most of us multiple times. And you get some things right, you get some things wrong. And in the end, we all ended up doing what we're doing now to just really help other owners get it right at the end because the free enterprise system is a truly wonderful vehicle to realize human potential and to achieve wealth and other things that are more important than wealth for people you love and care about in this world. But it's a double-edged sword and getting it right at the end is the statistics are really poor around that and much is left on the table, truly earned, but never realized. And that's what gets us out of bed every day. Excellent. Well, thank you for that. So let, let's start with the business itself for the business owner who wants to sell, say, you know, in the next 24 months, 36 months right now, you know, well ahead, well, hopefully well ahead of the time that they want to sell, what should they be doing? That's a great question. And I wish there was a cookie cutter answer um, because businesses in the privately held world are as unique as the people who own, start and run them. So the answer varies a bit, but there are certainly a lot of generalizations we can make. The, the bottom line is uh, from a very high level, the owner has to be ready first. Uh, businesses get under your skin when you've put decades of your life and blood, sweat and tears and risk and investment into them and often have other people like family or uh, people who are dear to you, I call chosen family involved in those businesses whose lives will be affected by the decisions you're going to make around exit. Um, that's a very uh, personal, hard thing to, to do. And 
Uh, it's really important not only to prepare the business, but to prepare yourself. So the first step really is clarifying your own goals and really knowing what you want from life going forward. Um, and in your world, you know, lifestyle, legacy, and philanthropy, what are those things that you need money for to live the life you want to live between now and when you um, kick the bucket? So um, clarifying goals is, is a big part in preparing the owner. Um, beyond that, preparing the business is, is enormous. And I think that is one of the areas that is uh, the don't know what you don't know thing. Entrepreneurs are successful, bright, hardworking people they they're used to conquering things and winning and achieving and many times i know from my perspective before i sold my businesses to to rockwell avionics and communication i was certainly in this situation uh, i didn't <clears throat> realize what it took and how different it was to prepare the business for a maximum value exit uh, compared to running it on a daily basis mm. they're totally different animals wow. and entrepreneurs really uh, look forward and they think of this thing at, at the end called exit as a project at the end, they're going to tackle like they have everything else that got them to where they are today. And, and uh, unfortunately, that's just uh, doesn't work that way. Because preparing is often measured as you suggested in years, not months or weeks. And so some of the issues with your business, if you were to take it through a mock due diligence, like a buyer would, are things that aren't easily fixed instantly. Sometimes it's people things and uh, people that need to be added or capabilities, unique talents of owners who are exiting uh, that simply can't be purchased and need to be built into the fabric of the organization before they leave and things like that. So the bottom line is runway matters. And if you have a couple of years, you can do a ton compared to waking up late going, geez, I just need to move on now, like often happens due to say a health concern or something like that, where they just don't have the option. So prepare yourself and prepare your business. And the best way to prepare your business, um, depending, is to do a mock due diligence or some people call it a reverse due diligence process before you ever get into a sales situation. And I'm not suggesting that as an indicator that a third party sale is, is necessarily the best option for owners, many times it is not. But the process of understanding what it takes to prepare your business for a successful third party sale and the things you'll do to your business to, to prepare it are always in the best interest of yourself and the future and the longevity of your business, regardless of the exit path even if it's a generational transfer to family with no monetization, right. um, they still need to inherit a really dialed in uh, business that is a quality thing. Think of it more like a franchise model, if you will, where here's the book, do these things and you'll make this margin. If you want to make more, buy another one or another one, right? That your business needs to be dialed in that way in terms of uh, the quality of it from an operational point of view, quality of it from a financial functionality point of view, and certainly from a relational point of view with the people who make it tick. And until you really understand the dysfunctions and the devaluing things that a third party buyer would bring you back to the table for, often late in the game when you're all ready to close and negotiate your price down are, are those types of issues. So, so if you put yourself through a mock due diligence, realize the things about your business that make it uh, less valuable than it could be if you worked on them and then incorporate improving those things into the operations of your business going forward. Uh, that's extraordinarily valuable uh, to do that so that at some point in the future, your business is a, a very dialed in thing. And at that point, you've enabled yourself to exit in a flexible way from that point forward anytime you choose. Um, so those are the two basic things is to give yourself the runway to prepare yourself and prepare your business. And the last thing that I think is absolutely vital, which is really a, oh, a kind of broken thing about the industry when it comes to serving affluent entrepreneurs is most of the time, owners don't really understand all of their exit options that may get them to their goals. 
And that's a huge part of the tra tragedy. Typically, they'll get referred to a, a single um, silo expert, whether it be an M&A firm or an investment bank or an ESOP uh, company, that, that's all they do. But <clears throat> they typically get referred by a very well-meaning advisor. As soon as that advisor hears them talking about possibly exiting or moving on, and then uh, that fact usually prevents owners from ever really exploring and fully understanding all of the exit options that they have. Mm. And until you really understand how generational transfers work, how uh, inside transfers to management can be done, regardless of whether or not they have the cash to buy the company today in a very tax efficient way, until you understand all the different ways you might recapitalize your business and just take chips off the table or continue to own it and cash flow it, but just get out of the daily operations if that's what's uh, really causing you to, to wanna make a change or to look at ESOPs in a very detailed way and understanding that tool, not only from a, from a financial efficiency point of view due to the tax, uh, benefits uh, or from an alignment point of view from the C-suite down to the rank and file. I mean, ESOP owned companies outperform non-ESOP owned companies significantly. Wow. If you do those statistics and there are reasons for it because the people who are going to get the future increase in value are the ones who work there. And uh, that makes a big difference. And they're also extremely flexible tools to accomplish exit goals for owners. Uh, you have a built-in buyer, you know you're going to get fair market value, you have the option to do minority up front and a second tranche later and a second bite of the apple or go 100%. I mean, there, there are so many um, ways to use that ERISA tool to accomplish exit goals once you fully understand it. And I relate it to, let's say, Armando, you had... 75 grand and you were gonna go buy a new pickup truck, which isn't very hard to do these days, <laughs> spend that much on a pickup truck. And, and if a friend of yours said, oh, geez, go buy a Chevy, they're the best. You know, would you just march right out and buy a Chevy without checking out the GMCs and the Fords and the Dodges? You know, I doubt you would, I doubt any of us would, yet that's precisely what happens so often with a business owner's largest financial asset. They get guided down one path and those companies, I'm not trying to speak negatively about them, but they do one thing. And I doubt you could find a business owner if you tried that said, oh yeah, I met with this investment banker and they analyzed my goals and my business and said, I'd really much be better off doing an ESOP and they <laughs> let me go. You know, that doesn't really seem to happen very often. Once you're in that silo, all paths seem to lead to that solution for exit. And that prevents owners from really understanding the other paths that may truly service their goals better. Um, and so that's one of the biggest tragedies is just moving forward in some way without really understanding all your options after all your hard work and investment and risk. It just doesn't make sense, but that's kind of the way our industry is built, unfortunately. Well, I, I like how you started with goals and making sure the owner is mentally ready to let go. So that when they do start walking down that path with whomever that might be, that mentally they've already made that decision that it's time. And uh, maybe the worst case is where they hang on too long and by that time they're burned out and they just want to be done and they just walk away and leave most everything on the table when they really, with some planning, could have avoided that altogether. So once, a, you know, once a, a business owner mentally is ready to say, you know, I'm done, I'm age, whatever, and I'm ready to, to step away and be done with my business, I can see what you're saying about not knowing how many options really might lay before them. And, you know, that, what that causes in my mind when you say that is, well, what's the difference in the price swing? If the starting price, sale price is $3 million and the guy has done no planning for two years, done no planning towards the exit, no investigation of the other options available, how much of a swing in price could that $3 million price tag be on the business? Well, that's a great question. And that number can be anything from zero on up. Uh, I'll give you an example. I was um, 
my, at my niece's wedding here a few weeks ago. And I ran into a business owner and started a conversation with him. And he, um, we got talking about things we're talking about. And, and he gave me the story of, well, you know, I was ready to sell my business and um, I, I couldn't get anything for it, he said, because I, I didn't realize that I provided so much of the value to my own business. I figured I had these financials and I was making good money and I could just sell that. And I, I, I'll admit he was maybe one of the bit more naive business owners out there compared to some. I agree with that. But still, he felt like his business was worth something. And, and then in the end, he said, I couldn't sell it for anything because I was going away. Hmm. And, you know, that's an extreme case, honestly, but there are a thousand shades of gray of that particular issue in what are the unique capabilities of the owner who will leave uh, from a business development point of view, from client relations, maybe public relations, whatever. Um, maybe they're just a visionary that can see the market and the economy and guide that business forward successfully uh, and scale it. But whatever those unique talents are that or will affect the financials of that business, you must duplicate those talents in the organization as you grow it to put yourself in an oversight only role that any buyer can do, or it will significantly devalue your business. So that's just one example of, of, um, of how that works and why you really need to uh, put yourself through a process of understanding uh, all of the things that it, a buyer would look at to assess their risk. And sometimes it's financial. I mean, the four basics are your financials better make sense. And someone should be able to look at your financials and understand where the money comes from and where it goes and make sense of it. They need confidence that they understand how your business works from a financial perspective. Hmm. And so, especially with smaller businesses, sometimes those financials aren't um, you know, gap approved or, or even reviewed by CPAs on an annual basis. And so as a, in the financial world, you want to start looking at reviewed financials and make sure your financials are up to speed. Secondly is operations. You know, I mean, if you think of your business as a box with the slot on the front and a crank on the side and you turn the crank and it spits out money, right? That's what a business does, whatever it is. The first question a buyer is going to ask is, well, how much money comes out that slot, right? And those are your financials. <laughs> and the second one is, the question is, wow, uh, how do you turn that crank? Can anybody turn that thing? Or is there some secret code only you know how to do, right? And so hopefully your, your business operations will be more franchise-like, more documented, more dialed in so that you have standard policies, procedures, uh, and best practices so that you... Uh, not only have all of those operational things dialed in, but from a people perspective as well. So job descriptions, performance metrics, accountability and tracking and so forth, so that um, someone can see not only what happens financially, but how this thing operates and how the people who are part of it uh, are, are part of those operations and that value. Um, and then uh, after that, you're really looking at key people. And if you have key players in your business, where if they disappeared tomorrow, it would affect the financial performance of the business. And if you were a buyer and you realized, boy, this rainmaker is responsible for 80% of the sales of the business, uh, uh, what happens if they go away for any reason? I mean, you might get hit by a beer truck step, stepping off the curb. It doesn't have to be disinterest. It can be something like that. And so if your key people don't have to stay after the sale, that's a devaluing factor, right? Because that person who's gonna buy your business if you go to a third party sale needs to know that they can produce those financials or better. And if there's no glue in the seat for those people, they don't have uh, long-term incentives they'll lose if they leave, That you know, uh, if they're comp in, in, in uh, compensation package and salary and so forth doesn't uh, make it difficult for them to leave, uh, you know, that's a problem. So we look at key people and do key person planning to make sure that they probably won't leave. And if they do leave, there's some funding to make sure that it's a, a pothole in the road and not a roadblock. 
Um, so key person planning is part of it. And then as we talked about, owners have to, if they wanna leave, um, have to make sure that their core capabilities uh, and their capacity has been replaced in the organization or will be by the, by the buyer. And it's really not very realistic to think that you're going to find a buyer who just happens to be just like you with your core capabilities and capacities, and they're just going to step in and be able to do everything as successfully as you do. So um, those are the fundamentals, but there are lots of other things that would come up in a, in a mock due diligence situation, such as client concentrations and vendor dependencies and things like that, that all need to be looked at. And um, the runway is important because the later in the game it is, the more of a disruption it is to, to do these things to the daily operations of your business. And when you think about it, I mean, the investment banking world functions this way quite a bit, to be honest, is um, it takes a lot of work to sell your business and work that only owners can do. And so it creates often a lot of lack of focus on your business plan and on doing what you would be doing to grow your business. And if that creates a lull, uh, a, a, a dip in the performance of your business right when you wanna sell it because that has to become your focus, obviously that's anti your goal, right? Of getting as much as you can for what you spent your life building. Yeah. So the more runway you have, the less disruptive it is to incorporate into your daily operations, these things to increase the value of your business. Hmm. So ideally how far in advance of the sales should they begin thinking about all this and, and planning and ring yeah. people? Is it two years? Uh, that's a great question. And I mean, in, in general, on the one hand, I could say, gee, if you really educate yourself fully about what it takes to get exit right, even if it's 10 years down the road, it'll change the way you run your business starting tomorrow. And there's some truth to that. Certainly as you think of your organization, as you grow it and you realize your and the other owners unique abilities that need to be replaced, the most efficient way to do that is as you grow your organization to realize, okay, these capabilities need to be replaced piecemeal in my leadership team. Um, then it's built into your business without having to go hire somebody to do what you do right before you sell it. And, and it makes your business more valuable. So on the one hand, more is better. On the other hand, a couple years is great. We can get a lot done in a couple of years by really going deep and analyzing the business from a relational point of view, operational and a financial point of view, and then putting uh, things in place, uh, policies, procedures, best practices, and the things we talked about going forward to get that thing uh, dialed in more and, and more scalable and uh, less dependent on, on the owners if they truly want to exit. So for a swing in value, we had a client recently sold for 25 million. And the, uh, it just makes me wonder from what you've described, there's a lot to it, obviously with the people, the processes, the clients, just you know everything that has to get dialed in, in into, like you said, into that box so someone can just step in and just start cranking that to produce cash. So it really makes me wonder the, the, the swing, that 25 mil value um, that's a great question. I'm sorry, I, I didn't answer that uh, very uh, concretely. I think if I had to guess from my experience, I would say that, you know, you're going to hate to hear this. This is what drives me crazy. I'll bet you half the potential in the free enterprise system is left on the table and earned and never realized. Wow. I mean, I can give you some statistics The third party sales, which may be the best statistics, 70% of them never close. The 30% that do close, close at very low average multiples of EBITDA compared to businesses that were prepared properly. Mm. Um, so I'm gonna say, you know, half is probably left on the table there. Generational transfers are far worse. 70% don't make it to gen two, 88% fail before they get to gen three. Only 3% 3 of privately held businesses transferred generationally make it to the fourth generation, um, which is really sad. And those transitions are often the most difficult because, um, you know, you have, your family has to be prepared to, to run that business as effectively as the previous generation. And many times that's not the case. And uh, so those sorts of uh, professional growth curriculums and things like that, that need to be put in place for family members, the more runway, the better for those. 
Um, but if you were to do a survey of inside transfers that weren't professionally done, where owners had people inside the business they knew and trusted that wanted to buy it and they hired an attorney to whip up some documents to say, great, I'm gonna pay you X bucks for this many years. We agree the value is this and it'll take five years and then I'll own it. The statistics on those are really awful. Hmm. Um, so I am I think conservatively, half the money is never realized. And I don't even think of it as money. I think of it as impact because, you know, I mean, the, the impact that, that would have on families of owners, on employees and their families, clients, vendors and their families, the community. I mean, that's the tragedy just kind of grows exponentially when you think about it. And if you really wanna wrap your mind around it in a mind blowing way um, and get really high level, I mean, there are 6 million privately held businesses in this country, 4 million of them are owned by baby boomers. And in the next five years, EPI says 3 million of them are gonna get out. Wow. Well, 3 million businesses, depending on the value, could be anywhere from 10 to 30 trillion in monetization. And let's just say it's 15 instead of 30. That's $15 trillion that will not flow through our nation's economy because it was never realized. Huh. The impact of that on our country, or if you want to go a next step further, since we're a global economy now, take 15 trillion out of the global economy. I mean, you, you can get as serious about thinking this way as you want, but uh, you know, the bottom line is 57, almost 60% of the gross national product of our country comes from privately held business. And if a lot of that gets left on the table, a lot of lives aren't going to turn out the way they really thought they would or want them to generationally. And I mean, the ripple effect of the monetizations of boomer businesses is just another way of following that group of us, <laughs> including me, <laughs> through life. So, um, you know, these are the things that really drive my partners and I to, to help people get it right at the end. Wow. So then where, where uh, you know, that, that founder who's had his company, her company for, you know, 25 years and now decides to sell, they're, you know, hearing what you're saying, which, which is a little bit, more than a little bit scary <laughs> because there, you know, there is a lot to it, of course, but it also makes me wonder, about the, uh, you know, some of the, the, the players in that buy, on the buy side, you know, if, if, if they know yeah. the same facts that you know, that you've just shared about the realization of value not being there and that owners maybe often are not as prepared as they should be for that sale, they can certainly take advantage of that. And they can oh, lowball right. offers in a way that the seller says, yeah, I'll take it and they walk away. You're so right, Armando. I mean, that the whole investment banking world, and we're generalizing, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to say that all M&A firms and investment bankers are crooks or dirt bags or anything like that. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that really by design, there are some flaws in that system. And um, some of those flaws are around the fact that most sellers are amateurs. They, mm -hmm. they have that one asset they're going to sell or maybe a couple businesses, but, but they are not professional sellers. Yeah. Yet the people who usually will buy their business through an M&A firm or an investment bank are definitely professional buyers. They do it for a living all day long. It's all they do and they are good at it. And they know the game and they know you don't know the game. And so they, they I believe, um, and they get paid to do one thing and that's sell your business. And if it goes late in the game and you say, no, they don't really make anything. They get a monthly retainer to hopefully be whole on their time, but it's a loss for, for them. Not as much as the business owner, but for them. So that by design just adds some conflicts in there, especially when you take it a step further and you realize that many times these professional buyers and brokers, they work with the same buyers over and over again, oftentimes having done a dozen or more transactions with these people who are growing through acquisition. And 
yet the seller is a one-off transaction to them. So you tell me who they will be more beholden to for their livelihood, um, the buyer or the seller. Yeah. So, you know, that conflict is really difficult to avoid. Um, and not a lot of people want to talk about that elephant in the room. And then, you know, these people have been through the game many times and oftentimes, you know, and they understand brain science and psychology and they, they realize how enticing it is. And so they have a process, many of them, that really set the seller up to back them into a corner and sell for a low price. Um, it's just, it's part of the game, right? They will often talk about really huge multiples in the beginning and very fast transactions and very quick due diligence and having an ideal buyer and, and uh, ask for some uh, you know, exclusivity contract for a short period of time to get this thing done and so on and so forth. And the, the gold just shows up in the eyes of the seller and after all their decades of hard work, seeing the potential money just dangling out there in front of them. And, um, and then as time goes on and due diligence stretches out and out and out and out and they start nickel and diming. And, and by the time they get to the end, there's so much invested time, energy, uh, money into that. Um, oftentimes they do just settle for far less than they thought and, that, and less than they could get. And, and the whole process is often designed really, unfortunately, to take advantage of a really anxious buyer uh, by professionals who know the game and are just trying to get that transaction over the finish line. And I think that's part of, partly why the statistics are so bad. Um, particularly on the multiples of EBITDA side, but also on the 70% that don't close because buyers do have a limit. And eventually, if it doesn't get them to the core capital they need for their lifestyle, legacy, and philanthropy, then, you know, a lot of times they just say no, uh, which is a, a different kind of tragedy because you can easily have six, nine months or a year into a potential sale that doesn't go through and the lack of focus on what you would have been doing to grow your business in that year and the money and the time and the energy you put in, not to mention oftentimes it's demoralizing to leadership and employees. And I mean, it's a big step back when a third party sale doesn't close. Hmm. Wow. You know, it makes a lot of sense what you, what you said that, you know, the seller of the business will do this once, maybe twice in his or her lifetime. But the, on the other side of the table are professional buyers. They do this over and over and over again. So they know the emotions the seller may be going through. They know the seller doesn't know what he or she doesn't know. And that they, they might, I can see how they certainly might just try to mentally wear down, maybe wear down the seller to get that price lower. Because in our, in our capitalist free enterprise system, you know, the, the, uh, the buyer is working for their stakeholders, not for the seller. So if they can get that asset for a lower price, then that's better for them and their stakeholders. So that's part of their responsibility, part of what they're trying to do. But it certainly does, as you said, put that seller, that founder of the business at a disadvantage going into that arena with them. Yeah, and I mean, if you, if you think about the process, the process really, and this is why we have a really unique business model and tools and pace and everything we've developed over the years. And, it, and it's all designed around creating the outcomes that the owner wants. First crystallizing and clarifying and challenging those outcomes so we know they're the real deal. And then they become the metrics for measuring everything. And if it gets to the place where it's not gonna create the outcomes we don't expect the owner to go through. But if you go through the process right and you analyze the business correctly and you know what you're doing, then you should never get to that point where all of a sudden you get a surprise that says, oh, gee, the business really isn't worth what we thought we could sell it for. Um, you know, you avoid those mistakes by understanding everything up front, the goals up front, the valuation of the business, the trajectory that it's on, um, and then making projections of the value of the performance and so forth, best case, worst case, really looking at those outcomes and how uh, those variables will affect the outcomes. 
and doing that up front as preparation, not uh, when you're late in the game going, oh, gee, oops, that doesn't work too well, right? So that's why it's so important to, to go through a preparation process for yourself in the business and just make sure you really know what you'll take and what you won't and what it means to your life to get that or not. And then as we go forward and we analyze with the potential of the business, um, we can tell up front the trajectory that that business is on with our experience knowing uh, what it is from an operational, relational, and financial perspective, uh, what that business is capable of in the next couple of years, two or three years, depending on what the exit uh, time frame is. And I mean, obviously, businesses are only capable of so much. And if you ask too much of the business and it can't support the goals, better to know it up front and regroup and come up with a different plan up front than to put in gobs of work and time and money and figure it out late, right? I mean, that's silly. But yet the industry works that way. So, mm -hmm. so that's why our process is what it is to really figure out what those outcomes, those desired outcomes are up front. And then they become the performance metrics for judging every exit path, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. um, so... And then, um, you know, lots and lots of modeling. So we have some proprietary modeling, which is some of the coolest stuff you'll ever see. Um, we can put the business in there, balance sheet and profit and loss and net net for taxes and everything else. And, and then we can project that business out into the future, not linearly, but in any kind of non-linear way you want. And, um, and then we can put owners' personal financials into the model as well. And it's all numerically integrated. So we can turn knobs on the business and watch the needles on the personal financial goals. And that becomes an incredible decision-making tool to analyze different exit paths and potential outcomes and, and really understand where you are, where you need to be. Does the business have the capacity to provide that? And if so, what do we need to do between now and that point in the future when you wanna exit to make sure the business fulfills that? Mm -hmm. Um, so there's a process to getting ready personally in the business, and then there's a process to pursuing um, that, those paths. And oftentimes we'll actually prepare a business for more than one exit path. Oftentimes owners don't realize that uh, a tax efficient transfer to management is possible. And when we educate them about that path and how it works and the fact that they can get their proceeds out uh, very tax efficiently, and the people they love and care about can own the business going forward, uh, that's very exciting to them. And so oftentimes that path is chosen, but it's a longer term path. It might take three to five years for that uh, transaction to be done. So obviously the, the health and future success of the business is important, just as we talked about for any exit path. But, um, but sometimes we'll also prepare the business for a third party sale behind the scenes because uh, we need to understand if that takes too long and owners uh, will cause the owners to, to pivot to a third party sale, then we need to be prepared for that, right? So we'll, so we'll understand the triggers that would cause that pivot. And, we'll, and then we'll also behind the scenes as part of the prep, get the business ready for a successful third party sale in case that pivot has to be taken, right? So many times it's understanding the goals, understanding all the options, prioritizing options, one, two, three, or whatever, and then um, putting things in place to pursue option A and do the best we can. And if something happens, it's not like they don't want to exit, they still want to exit. Well, then we may have to pivot to plan B. So it's just, if you're focused on creating the outcomes uh, and you're agnostic as to what path gets them there, the world, kind of changes at that point and everything becomes focused on the outcome rather than the particular path or the process or whatever. So for the, you know, for the founder, you know, this has been say his longtime business forever. He's the sole owner of the company and now he's thinking of stepping out. You know, once, once he steps out of that company and whatever that step out looks like and, and, uh, and this is where we, we often meet them when they're thinking about what is that going to look like? You know, I'm at a certain point today, I want to sell this business at some point and then live beyond that till age 100, you know, with my spouse and travel, spend time with the grandkids, fund college education for next generations, et cetera. So we often have that, those conversations with them. And my question for you is when you're talking with that business owner, say the, the man who's had the business 25 years, uh, he may have what he thinks in retirement is going to be perfect for him, 
but how is that communication with say him and his spouse? Are they on the same page about that? Is she part of that dialogue as you're talking with him or with the owner so that there are no surprises that uh, now that he sold the company wants to sail the world and she's gone, no, I'm not gonna go yeah. sailing with you. How involved yeah. is the spouse in that dialogue? That's a that's a that's a great question. It almost seems silly to have to ask it. I I, I realize, but um, very very smart to ask that. Yeah, um, it's it's the people in our lives that and and how the decisions we make will affect them that really drives a lot of behavior and decision making, right? And this is a classic case of that. So in our process, we always involve the wives, and many times the children. Uh, if they're active in the business, certainly. But even if they're not active in the business, but they're old enough to have had a view of the business as they've grown up and the way it's affected the family, um, the early deep discovery part of our process where we help the client crystallize their goals and everything uh, is just a whole gob of interviews where we sit down for an hour and a half with the owner and their spouse and talk through those issues, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly about being a business owner, why you want to get out, you know, how important is it, you know, the timing of it, and, and so on and so forth. And, and then um, when every day is a Saturday, you know, what are you going to do with yourself? You can only play so much golf, you can only catch so many fish, whatever the, the passions are. Um, and then you know, it's very easy to just take surface answers for that stuff and write it down and say, oh, okay, great. We got that figured out. But I think you know better than that. It doesn't work that way. You need to challenge those things and you need to pit one against another and say, well, if you can't do it all, which one's going to win? Yeah. You know, and really help them go through the process in their mind of living with the idea of, okay, I don't have to get up every day now and pay attention to this thing that needs so much of my care and feeding. Yeah. Um, and so crystallizing those goals and drilling down on them and challenging them and playing one against the other until you really get convinced that, okay, I think they got it figured out. And you can kind of see it when the lights go on and they get excited about thinking about that sort of stuff. So um, it's just got to be part of the very, very early part of the process, you know. And for us, we take it a step beyond actually that and uh, we interview all the stakeholders in the business too the people who are key to the performance of the business that they really do care about who helped them get there and we we get the core dump from those guys too about what they think of the business and uh, the SWOT analysis and so forth and what they want their future relationship to the business to be as the, after the exit or the succession event and 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 we get all those chips on the table because if you get late in the game and the owner realizes they're going to accomplish all their goals, but their exit path they've chosen is really going to kind of, you know, screw over the people they care about. Maybe they decided to go to private equity because all those numbers worked great. And then late in the game, they figure out that the three or four people they care about most in the leadership team are redundant and they're going away going to lose their jobs and their family doesn't get the benefits anymore of being a part of the business and the future growth, you know, that that's not good. Right. So we need to understand those impacts up front and we need to make sure that they're included in their decision-making process or you'll get to bumps in the road that'll mess you up in the, in the end. So getting all of those perspectives and feelings and thoughts on the table up front from all of the people that will influence the decision-making of the exiting owners absolutely foundational to mm -hmm. to getting rid of those rotten statistics we talked about right so yeah how do you so john how do you how do you do that when you talk with the say the, the the five key managers of the business for example how do you do that to where they are not afraid that the business is being sold and they're going to lose their jobs how do you how do you approach that so that they're not threatened by your questions you know, that's another good question. And everybody asks that. And in the end, you'd be amazed, Armando. It's the exact opposite of what you're thinking, of, of, of what you think they would be thinking. Because we don't get hired to sell a business. We get hired to create succession, whatever path that is. It may be a third party sale. And the only way that succession is a successful thing 
is that we have to build a culture <clears throat> into that business of longevity. We have to build a culture of succession into that business. And when owners hire us, it means that they're taking a lot of time and energy and money to pay attention to making sure that when they go away, that business is going to march on as or more successfully as it has under their control. Okay. And so when, when key players and employees in general figure out that owners not only are paying attention to and concerned about longevity of the business after they go, <clears throat> but that they're actually including key people <clears throat> oh, excuse me, uh, in the process and giving them a voice, it's an amazingly comforting thing to them to know that, hey, these people care about what happens to this business after they leave. They're not just going to get their money and run and forget about us. Hmm. And believe me, that stuff is on their mind. I mean, if you work for a privately held business <clears throat> and you see the owners getting a bigger forehead and more gray hair, those thoughts go through <laughs> your head, right? I mean, they wonder, oh man, what's going to happen to the business when these guys leave? You know, they're all thinking that. And so we make sure that they think correctly about that. Yeah. <clears throat> so I, I imagine maybe the, the customer base also sees the growing forehead and the, and the gray hair as well. And maybe they might get some concerns as well about how long oh, sure. person will be in business. Well, you know, everybody, vendors, clients, I mean, community, it depends on who you talk to, but sure. But, but in the end, it should be a very comforting thing to know that the business owners are putting so much energy into making sure that that business um, has longevity built into it. Hmm. Okay. So what have, we, what have we not touched on, John, that that founder really should hear during this conversation as he or she is thinking about sign the company in the next, you know, say 36 months or so, They've really taken no steps yet to, to walk down that path, but they know they need to. What else should they hear in this conversation that is relevant to them? We've covered a lot of really good stuff. I, I guess if I had to just really distill it all down, um, they need to get comfortable in their gut that they're really making good decisions, right? I mean, entrepreneurs don't just want to be sold something through some transactional thing and convinced how wonderful life's going to be afterwards. I mean, they don't think that way. They don't make decisions that way. They want to understand the upside, the downside, what things look like in the worst of case and in the, in the best of times. And they, they really need to <clears throat> see the impact of their decisions. And so trust your gut. If, if you get into a situation by accident or through some other means where you realize, you know, is there more I could and should be thinking about? And you have any little tiny discomfort in your gut about whether you're making the very best decisions about exit, put a pause on it and back up and, and, and then do the things we talked about. Understand all your options. Look at upsides and downsides understand the impacts and and through a proper preparation you will get that comfort and that confidence in your gut that you're doing the right thing and that the impacts you're trying to create for yourself and your family and others you care about are really what's driving what's driving things yeah. so i would just say trust your gut particularly around exit um like you have the other things the other risks you've had to assess some right. way. And then secondly, um, well, you know what it's like when you're running a business. It's a busy life and there's always more to do than, than you can get done. And getting the balance between working in the business and working on the business is always a challenge. And we're talking about adding things to the plate on the, on the business side instead of in the business side always a challenge. So um, I think one of the other really important things that we haven't touched on is, <clears throat> I don't know how to say it exactly, but you're not going to be able to do the heavy lifting yourself. 
something's going to suffer, right? So that's a huge part of the reason that we've developed our tools and our process uh, and that it's not some very quick thing. There's a pace to, to it before fatigue sets in. There's a, a way to make decisions confidently without having to do all the heavy lifting. And so if you're, if you're not, if you haven't found anybody yet who can really do that heavy lifting, who has a process that's pre-designed and, and proven successful so that you can do what you've been doing every day to make your business valuable and not derail your life with a bunch of extra stuff. That's important, right? Because, and that's the whole reason we follow through these plans through to fruition, because if we just developed a world-class succession plan for someone and said, here you go, it's all written down, how you can transfer this to your management. Here are the triggers that would cause you to pivot to a third party sale. Here are the things you need to do to your business to make sure if that happens, you're gonna be good to go and blah, blah, blah. And we dumped it on them. You and I both know what would happen. Probably not much. Yeah. Right? You'd come back a year later and say, how's it going? And you're oh, well, gee, you know, COVID or whatever. Um, so that's the reason we, we follow through to fruition and we treat them like the CEO of their plan yeah. and we call on them to have meetings that are relatively brief with one particular focus to educate, to help make a decision to whatever it's for. And, and we understand the process and the pace, uh, and the sequencing to get that uh, moving and to keep it rolling and avoid all this start stop that's so typical in the industry and just really help them educate, understand, plan, continue forward and, and take action through to fruition. So um, that would be my other comment is have realistic understanding of how much extra stuff you can do and work with a team who routinely um, does the heavy lifting and guides the process, choreographs it, and, and works straight through until it's done. And is it the similar or same process, whether the business is intended to go to the next generation or to somebody else? And I'm asking really the, the family dynamic when there are, when the second generation is working, or maybe the third generation also is working in that business, does that change your process? Good question. It doesn't change the process. It changes what we do, though. So the process, it's think of it like a Subway, right? Subway is a pretty interesting example. When you go to Subway and you go through the line there, they teach those kids a process. And that process can produce 15,000 different sandwiches. It's the same process, but the sandwich is different. Our process is very similar. We have a process for decision-making and we follow it all the time. If it guides us down a generational transfer, the actual scope of work to do the prep for the business and make that succession successful is different stuff than it would be if it wasn't a generational transfer. So for example, you know, we, we, we really oftentimes in family business, family dysfunction creates business dysfunction. It's just that simple, right? And if we want to optimize the performance of the business, we need to address those things. Those are difficult things. And I kind of get paid to do that, right? It's, we have difficult conversations and we do fix a lot of family dysfunction, not that we're psychologists or anything, but um, we, we look at it all through the business lens. And if the whole family is dependent on that business for their future financial wealth and success, then we better make sure that what we do, make sure the business is gonna to continue to be successful. And why give it to family if it's gonna go down the tubes? Yeah. That won't serve anybody. Right, so, right. so when we put it through the business lens and use our tools to help the generations understand the impact if it's not successful, and the impact of any other types of things are having on the business. For example, often times uh, somebody gets overlooked for the next CEO role and they have a chip on their shoulder, some other sibling got it. And so what do they do? They pay him an exorbitant amount of money to keep him happy, even though the role in, his, in the business might be worth half of what they're paying. You know, that's a problem, right? That devalues the business. It makes the business less financially stable, less profitable. And so oftentimes, um, a business first um, mindset has to be 
understood and adopted that if you want a position in the business and you get it, it's going to be because you're the most qualified person, right? And that's required or that business won't be around providing you with a paycheck for like you hope probably, right? So sometimes we have to address those issues and let them, and, and we, we do it the same way with other decisions, right? We help them understand the impact of the issue on what's important to them. And then it helps them to wrap their mind around why they should fix it and what they have to do if they want to <clears throat> do bigger and better things in the business, right? So um, the, the generational transfers are challenging. You know, we have a bunch of them going on right now. And um, you just have to dive into that stuff and put it on the table. And so one of the things we do up front, which is absolutely vital, is we put a lot of energy into making sure it's a good fit personally, as well as professionally for us with our clients. Because if you're gonna attack the child and fix the dysfunction of the business and the family maybe too, it takes a certain kind of relationship to do that. And if, if, if the mindset isn't really caring of others, if it's not open-minded and teachable, um, it's really hard to get that stuff done. And we've learned that, you know, the hard way over the decades. Um, so we put a lot of vetting up front. We have a lot of filters up front to make sure that, that we can have a very open, honest, transparent relationship with everybody involved <clears throat> in the engagement. Um, otherwise, we probably won't be successful. And, and we talk about that right up front. And we let them know that, hey, um, if there's an issue, we're going to talk about it now. You know, um, and we're just going to lay it on the table in an open, honest, steel sharpening steel type of way. No blame, no nothing like that going on. But it's an issue. It's it's keeping us from getting the outcomes that we've all agreed we're here to create, and we need to deal with it. And so we put it on the table and we work through it. And um, we're, I guess, kind of uh, famous, at least in our own minds, for being being successful at those. <laughs> those tough situations. Well, the navigating families can be, you know, it can be challenging, it can be tricky. But uh, like you said, that business, if the business is there to sustain the family, then it doesn't help the family if you've got to accommodate one family member who really is bringing down the overall value of the business and therefore it's not being able to feed everybody the way it, it could or yeah. maybe it should. Yeah, and, and every scenario is different, you know, and there aren't any guarantees in this life, but we've been through a lot of tough deals like that. We had one case I remember where um, four siblings, uh, either the sibling or the spouse of the sibling was active in the business. Dad had was still involved on the board, but actually passed the business on to the non-blood spouse of the youngest daughter instead of the oldest son. Oh. That was a really challenging situation because... There was um, a health event that triggered the whole mess. And uh, one of the siblings developed terminal cancer and died oh. rapidly. And that, um, and then his sister, who was the CFO, said, you know, I'm ready to get out too. I, I, you know, I need to move on with my life. And that triggered a whole bunch of stuff where siblings wanted out. And, <clears throat> and, uh, and so it, that was an internal buyout of some family by other family. And it was really challenging because one of the people who had to sell their shares was the brother that had been passed over and had a really big chip on his shoulder and was in the scenario I talked to you about where he was <clears throat> not being compensated correctly. And um, anyway, we were successful getting that done in the end because of just the decision-making process we have. The, the, the CEO who was running it, he was the most conservative guy on the planet. Company had no leverage, no debt. And he needed to borrow $9 million. The business needed to borrow $9 million to buy out the siblings. Wow. And he just came to us and said, I'm, I'm not comfortable with that. You know, we have, I'm, I'm a conservative guy. And we were able to use our modeling and show him that if he took on the debt with the financing, we, and we generate all the financing for our deals as well. And so with all the different uh, bank term sheets and things, and the one we would select, we sat down and we put all those covenants for the, <clears throat> the debt into the modeling. And we were able to play around and show him that 
gross revenues could go down by 26% without making any other changes to improve profitability, et cetera, and still be okay covering the covenants for the debt. And they were on a steep growth trajectory and he was running the company. And he said, I know that's not happening under my watch. And he got comfortable <laughs> and he did that. And we successfully convinced the brother to sell uh, because he was aligned with one of the other siblings whose life he was going to mess up if he didn't. And so in the end, we got it all done. And that was like four years ago. And a year ago, they came back to us and sold the company. And he got $27 million for the shares he bought for $9 million three years earlier. Wow. So he was very happy that we helped him to make good decisions around what to do with that succession plan. Um, and that was a classic situation where a lot of tough stuff. Wow. Wow. Well, good. That, that's excellent. Thank you for that, that example of, of a success story of how it worked out well for the company, for the family, and you were able to help them navigate what were some difficult you know, family matters that had to, that had to have happened triggered by an unforeseen health event that just got kind of a snowball effect on everything in, in that picture. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a fun, fun thing that we do, Armando. We all feel very fortunate to do what we do and uh, be able to help people get it right in the end. It's, uh, we're all just kind of built that way. And uh, I think all of us have those things that stick in our craw about our past and when we sold our businesses that we wished we knew about more at the moment. And then again, we did some things right, that valuable experience too. But right, uh, right now, I don't think you could uh, drag any one of us partners away with a team of wild horses because uh, we're really enjoying what we're doing and making a difference. And with what's going on with the boomers right now, I mean, it's, uh, it's an important time. Right, it is, it is. Yeah, it's great you have that experience, you know, having gone through that, that buy-sell yourself, you know, you can certainly relate to the people you're helping, the, the families that you're working with and that. Uh, I know that when I sold, you know, my company years ago, you know, I learned a lot, made a lot of mistakes, but, you know, sometimes those mistakes really give you the most value and really help you going forward the most. Amen. If it doesn't kill us, it makes us stronger, right? <laughs> you, just can't, it you just can't have too many of those. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hear you. I hear you. Well, John, excellent. Thank you so much for the conversation today. And, and we may just have to have a, a few more of these, a, a little more drilling down on some of the points that, that you touched on today. And if people want to get a hold of you, what number should they call to reach you? Um, I'm on the WealthPoint website, but my uh, best number for me I can give you is 541-450-5060. And my email is just John C, J O H N C at wealthpoint.net. Okay, excellent. So I'm happy to talk to anybody who's got these thoughts running around their head and trying to make sense of it all. Well, you, you, you did an excellent job just kind of covering what all goes into that pot. And I, I love that visual, the box with the slot and the, you know, somebody cranking that <laughs> to spit cash out the slot <laughs> because that really simplifies. If the buyer can buy that, how valuable is that to the buyer? You're right. It makes it simple. Yep. Well, sometimes simple is better. Excellent. Less is more sometimes, that's for sure. Right. Well, Armando, I appreciate the opportunity. I'm glad you put the time into doing this, and I hope it helps a bunch of people wake up soon enough in the game to get everything they deserve from their operating assets. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. Thank you, John. Really appreciate it. Okay, you take care. You too. Bye now. Bye for now.